Thank you, Dr. Zunas, for um, coming and uh, giving us the time to speak mm -hmm. um, with us. Um, my first question is just around the idea of consent-based power. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've seen that you've, you've spoken about that in the past, and particularly uh, the Philippines uh, People Power Movement. Mm -hmm. um, and in that situation, you were talking about how uh, people stopped obeying orders. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you could talk about what does it take to get to a point where soldiers particularly mm -hmm. stop obeying orders? Mm -hmm. Well, ultimately, a ruler is only as powerful as people's willingness to obey him. And uh, as we saw in the Philippines, for example, that uh, the, um, you know, when Marcos ordered the troops to um, attack the um, hundreds of thousands of non-violent uh, demonstrators uh, surrounding uh, Camp Krami, uh, they refused to fire. Uh, they, um, and we've seen similar things in East Germany and uh, in, in Ukraine and uh, in, in, in Bolivia, and then most recently in Tunisia, uh, where specific orders to attack were um, uh, were refused, and and, and and basically it comes from uh, you know uh, soldiers generally come in, uh, come from uh, the ranks of, of uh, disproportionately from poor and working class people. They more often than not have more in common with the pro democracy protesters than they do with the dictatorship. And when you look into the to the crowds, you'll see. Um, uh, they tend to see uh, you know, friends, neighbors, um, maybe even children, <laughs> brothers, sisters, and it makes it very difficult uh, for for soldiers to obey in, in that regard. By contrast, if they are met by um, armed resistance or even even driving, uh, they tend to close ranks. Uh, they tend to they're much less likely to obey orders. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, much more, much more likely to obey orders to attack, and uh, if they feel very personally threatened. Um. And so I've seen that you've um, said about the situation in Syria at the moment, that it's both um, a tragedy and a, a source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the media, um, the tragedy is probably being emphasized a bit mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about in what way Syria might be an inspiration mm -hmm. as well? Well, I've never known, known people who have faced such a savage brutality that have showed such courage and, and tenacity uh, in, in the face of that kind of repression. And uh, e even though it's increasingly uh, taking the uh, form of an armed uh, resistance, there is still a large, uh, widespread, uh, nonviolent resistance continuing. Uh, there are continued, uh, you know, strikes. There are continued uh, public protests. Uh, they, um, in many ways, Syria seemed one of the less likely uh, places. I was one of the few people who predicted the uprising in Egypt and and the uprising in Bahrain, but uh, the uh, Syria was not on my list. <laughs> Uh, I, th I felt that uh, civil society was too weak, the secret police was too strong, the uh, party apparatus that had been around for many, many years, it was not just one-man rule like in many of these cases, it was very much of a, an oligarchy with a, with a very, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a basis in the Ba'ath Party that had, had um, you know, been able to build alliance with, alliances with certain uh, minority communities and business elites and others. And, and so on paper, it seemed very unlikely, uh, the, 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 the you know, situation for such a widespread uprising, but a, a combination of the, the uh, determination of the, uh, the pro-democracy uh, protesters, as well as some as stupidity, frankly, by the, by the regime, their, um, their overreaction, their, their use of very blunt uh, you know, tactics, um, you know, create a situation where we do see in, in entire cities in, in, in rebellion, and uh, it's um, and it, I'm 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 hoping that the uh, though, though I don't make moral judgment about the the, 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 fa the fact that many people have taken up arms, I still believe that uh, they're actually stronger if they maintain the uh, the nonviolent discipline in terms of it being the best way to weaken the um, still fairly broad alliance of support. The uh, regime still has. I mean, it's a minority to be sure, but it's a fairly sizable minority, and, and, and I'm afraid that armed resistance, especially if there's uh, proceed to have foreign intervention, will only solidify uh, the the base of support the regime has. Um, so, in the situation of Syria, um, it seems that the violent repression actually galvanized opposition, um, and it's interesting in. Uh, in perhaps other countries like uh, Morocco or Jordan, there wasn't um, as violent repression. Do you think that nonviolent um, resistance works uh, particularly strongly in situations of violent 
Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's paradoxical in certain ways that uh, that uh, that often the more brutal the regime, uh, the uh, the more likely that uh, you know, non nonviolent resistance will will end up um, end up working, and um, in, in that the the, um, the repression creates a paradoxical reaction. It, it creates a you know, some some people refer to uh, compared it to jujitsu or aikido. You know where the weight of the state is is used against it. That uh, many people who might be neutral, who you know, may not be particularly fond of the regime, but they're afraid of change and they you know, don't know which side to, to um, support, when when they see the, the brutality going uh, down against uh, nonviolent uh, you know, protesters, they obviously you know, sympathize with the um, uh, with the opposition. Again, this contrasts with, 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 with violent resistance, where people may be more likely to uh, side with the regime in the name of, of order. And, and thanks to new communication technologies, you know, people having um, having telephones that can film <laughs> uh, film events uh, and get the real story out instead of the official version, it's uh, it, it's easier to take advantage of that popular reaction uh, to uh, repression against uh, nonviolent protests. Um, I guess my next question is about what um, people in Western countries like Australia and the U.S. can do or should do. Um, and in those technologies that you talk about, we can follow so closely these events. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that has led to a lot of calls for things like foreign intervention, mm -hmm. um, because you see these people struggling, and mm -hmm. that seems to be the rea reaction. Mm -hmm. um, what's your response to those calls for, for intervention? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think that because of the history of foreign intervention in the, in the Middle East, that in many cases it would play right into the regime's hands. There's a strong sense of nationalism and even xenophobia uh, that I'm afraid, uh, in in many cases, you know, would um, uh, end up strengthening uh, the regime, uh, particularly in a situation like Syria, where they do have a strong national uh, um, tradition. I mean, Gaddafi had alienated pretty much everybody, but but the Syrian regime still has something of a social base, albeit minority, and. Um, and I and I, 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 I think it's very very hard to to imagine a way that it would, it would avoid making things worse. Yes, a lot of people are dying in Syria, but far far more died in, in Libya, even though it's a much smaller country in in, in population. And the str struggle went on for a much shorter uh, period of time. Uh, the um, I think when we look at Western uh, nations, the first thing uh, we should, should do, like the Hippocratic Oath for for physicians, is do no harm. And that uh, as long as the United States and Britain and other countries continue to provide arms and security assistance to uh, di dictatorial regimes that suppress their, their population, I mean, U.S. and uh, British aides continue to Bahrain, even after they brutally suppressed what um, proportionally was the largest nonviolent uh, pro democracy movement that we, we've seen in the entire Middle East, and, and one that, you know, given the strong you know, middle class uh, of Bahrain and, and the, the history of pluralism. Uh, in, in that country would have been one most likely to succeed and create a democratic model, and yet you know, the United States and Britain are still supporting that, uh, uh, that, that government. So I think before we start talking about intervening on the side of the, um, of the, of the uh, opposition, uh, we, we need to first look at uh, you know, the ways that Western nations are supporting the uh, repression. Uh, one of the most uh, outspoken advocates, and one of, indeed one of the intellectual uh, fathers, if you will, of the concept of the responsibility to protect is, is, is Gareth Evans, who, as many Australians know, as, as, foreign, as foreign minister, was a big supporter of the Indonesian regime uh, at the height of their repression in East, Tim East Timor, which is far worse you know, uh, by uh, many magnitudes of what we've seen in, in, in Libya or Syria. And of course, this, this, this perceived hypocrisy or double standard is used by these tyrants to say, oh, um, you know, this is not liberal internationalism, this is just an excuse for Western imperialism. So I, I think it, it, it's really, really important uh, that, that, well, I, I, can't, uh, I can't categorically say uh, that, that it, it's never appropriate to, to, um, you know, to, to intervene uh, militarily. Uh, that I think the first order is, is to clean up our own, <laughs> uh, our own house in terms of the responsibility of Western nations in supporting uh, repressive governments. Um, speaking of cleaning up our own houses, um, some commentators have um, made links between the Occupy movements and the Arab Spring, um, and 
and it strikes me that they're quite different movements. Mm-hmm. But um, I wondered what, as someone who's um, looked a lot into um, people power and people uh, nonviolent resistance, what are the differences between those movements? Well, I think what they have in common, basically, is they're, 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 it's an um, example of the dramatic growth of global civil society. Uh, that um, in what we find in, um, in autocratic governments in, in the Middle East, of course, is a more blatant example of elite rule and lack of accountability. And many Western capitalist societies, particularly uh, the United States, while we have electoral uh, democracy, while we have uh, uh, individual political freedoms, which I am, uh, yeah, as an American, I'm, I can't help but be proud of, uh, we nevertheless do have a um, uh, a, a kind of the, the, the uh, domination of the political process by a minority of very wealthy individuals and influential corporations does severely uh, compromise um, a real democracy in any meaningful sense of the term, and so um, and and so I think in, in many ways they these are these are all you know uh, they're both all all these movements are for uh, you know democracy and for social justice even though the forms of governments that uh, they go against are, are very different. This difference, I think, is, is um, you know, on the one hand, it, it's easier to organize politically, obviously, in countries where you don't have to worry about uh, media censorship or the police coming in at 3 o'clock in the morning and, and dragging you off or, um, or you know, uh, show trials or you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, at, at the same time, uh, in, in many ways, the... Um, uh, the, the oppression or the the, uh, the in, injustice is not quite as clear as if it's a single tyrant or, or, or uh, and the like and and so it, it's um, um, in certain ways it, it's more difficult you know despite the advantages in terms of um, the you know, right of assembly and, 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 and freedom of association and, and those those kinds of civil and political rights it's, it's often harder to go at the underlying you know, social and econ- uh, the, the lack of social and economic rights. In, in societies where you have you know such a um, you know, such a concentration of, of, of economic power in so few hands, uh, but uh, what has really, really struck me, I think, is is the um, is, is the way these movements have inspired each other. You know, I, I, um, I've seen you know, Egyptian flags uh, from you know, Madison, Wisconsin, to Oakland, California, uh, sort of acknowledgement of that 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 uh, that that connection as well as. Uh, Messages of solidarity from you know Tahrir Square, you know to um, uh, you know, to various uh, you know uh, places in the United States, you know where there have been these these kinds of kinds of uh, protests. And I think another yeah, another similarity I think it is that many of these are youth-led movements, and that that young people are recognizing that the um, the old ways of doing politics are are not. Uh, addressing the very real concerns of, of, of the younger generation, and that um, sometimes extra legal or or, or, um, or new ways of of of, um, of political action are necessary. Um, and so, do you think that these uprisings in the Middle East, um, in terms of the long term, their long term prospects for change, do you think that um, they're going to concentrate perhaps on civil and political rights more than those underlying economic issues, or do you think it's going to be a wholesale well, change? Well, they're interrelated. I, I mean, I, I, th- I think that, um, you know, from, from my, my visits in the Middle East, I, often people talk about uh, having more, you know, democratic governance, not, not as much for its own sake, but as the only vehicle through which they can have social and economic rights, because if you have an unaccountable government, if you have have a government that, that monopolizes uh, you know the media that's not uh, transparent that uh, suppresses dissent, you know whether it be for political rights or the rights of, of workers through uh, free labor unions and other forms of organization, if you, if you have that kind of regime, you can't have economic and, and, and social justice, and so um, that uh, that uh, you, know, you know liberal democracy, you know, I would argue, is a necessary but not necessarily sufficient uh, you know vehicle. Uh, for you know, creating a, a more more just society. So I think you know, having, uh, but, but as as you have these building blocks, you're going uh, you're, you know, through through a democratic ins- uh, institutions. Then you know, people are ha- have the freedom to mobilize, perhaps for more radical changes. We saw this in Latin America when you had a series of of, of, of nonviolent movements, 
uh, in, um, in Chile and in, in Bolivia, in Argentina, Brazil, and elsewhere that brought down these uh, dictatorships you know, back in the um, uh, you know, 1980s. And, but, uh, and, and, and subsequently you had a series of you know, maybe center-right you know, governments that uh, you know, allowed for political freedom but continued some of the same you know, economic you know, policies that combined with uh, structural adjustment programs and other things imposed by uh, the International Monetary Fund and other international financial institutions. Uh, it did not improve the, the lot of, uh, of ordinary people. But because they had the political freedom, you had uh, you know, peasants and, and, and workers and the progressive church and human rights uh, activists and women's activists and indigenous activists and, and, and other people who could mobilize and, and, and start working for social and economic justice. And in recent years, you've had a, a, a series of election victories by uh, left-leaning governments that are starting to address these uh, underlying uh, you know, social and ec uh, economic issues. So, um, I, I, well, I, I, I think the, um, the first priority is creating the, uh, the um, civil and political rights. I, I, I think it's inevitable that they will lead to demands for greater social and economic justice as well. Um, I guess just a final question. Um, how have you seen, now that we're getting towards the end of um, Obama's first term, how would you uh, rate his foreign um, policy um, over those four years? Mm -hmm. Well, he, in, he's rejected the dangerous neoconservatism of the previous administration. He's pursued more multilateral uh, approaches to, to, to problems. And uh, he, he recognizes uh, that um, you cannot uh, promote uh, democracy by invading and occupying countries. Iraq, of course, has been a, a disaster in, in this regard, and, and he was one of the um, principled uh, uh, political figures who opposed the war from the beginning. But uh, the, the unfortunately, um, I guess you know, perhaps uh, you know, because he uh, is sensitive that any, any really push for democracy is going to be associated with the old administration. I mean, in many ways, Bush did for democracy what uh, Stalin did for socialism. You know, gave it a bad name in terms of uh, uh, as, as an excuse for uh, for um, uh, intervention uh, and, and domination. But uh, sensitive to that fact, combined to pressure from you know, powerful interest in the uh, military, and intelligence, and community, in many ways, he's fallen back to the uh, realpolitik. You know, continuing to support uh, dictators and, 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 and stability. Now, he said some very eloquent things about the pro-democracy struggles in Tunisia and Egypt, but they were literally the day after the dictator <laughs> the dictators left. It was not, he did not play a proactive role. He, uh, it seemed like more uh, of a situation where he didn't want to um, uh, be on the wrong side of history than, than desiring to be a catalyst. The one area I give it credit for is that um, while Bush gave a kind of a simplistic um, um, institutional role of, and view of, of, of human rights, that is, elections, meaning your democracy, even though they could be easily rigged and manipulated. I mean, even praise the uh, re-elections of Saleh in Yemen and in Mubarak uh, in Egypt, even though they were you know, clearly unfair elections. Uh, Obama tends to take a more, more agency view of, 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 of democracy and human rights. I mean, he emphasizes you know, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the media. On, on, with the belief that if you have those things, uh, you that people can build democracy themselves, and that he recognized that, that the democracy ultimately comes from from below, and I think that that's that's a subtle but I think important distinction. I only wish that he would take it further, and uh, and and be willing to uh, to take a tougher line towards dictators and be more willing to to uh, suspend or condition uh, military aid. Uh, and, and the like, and, and, and certainly, uh, uh, in, in as well as stronger line in terms of uh, military occupation, such as uh, is Israel's uh, occupation of Palestinian land and Morocco's occupation of Western Sahara. Um, so there, there's plenty to criticize, but I think on, uh, on certain levels he does have a greater awareness of how change ultimately take pla takes place and how democracy uh, will ultimately take hold. Okay, uh, th thanks a lot. Yeah, my uh, pleasure.